as fans will have been able to to see, um, there's a number of questions in this that are um, sort of directed at you, your role and the the wider um, full time staffing of the the football club. Obviously, some of these questions are are pretty direct, so we'll we'll just read them um, as they come. And the yeah. the first one that um, is on the sheet is: Have you considered resigning? Okay, so it's a bit hard to answer that question because you don't know the reason why someone's directly asking them it. So what's their intention when when they're asking that question? Listen, I think what we have at this football club is is a passionate set of fans. Uh, the club would be nowhere without the fans, and and we appreciate that as a as a football club every day. You know, the decisions that I make on behalf of the board won't always be popular decisions. Hopefully, I get more right than I get wrong. But you know, we are a new business; we learn as we go. You know, if we fail, we learn quickly, and that's any new business that would be out there. Uh, my my thoughts around that question are: it's probably come from a place of maybe I don't, I don't know who asked it but maybe that some of the fans who are, who are potentially banned so if you think back to when i came on board at the end of february you know no one re- really would have known my name and you know in an ideal world it, it would have been best if that just carried on that way because ultimately this club should, should be about dave mcnab and the team he puts on the pitch it shouldn't be about neil sears I, you know i'm not i'm not here for that i'm just here to give dave and the team the best support as possible so the club get promoted but ultimately within that there will be some tough decisions that i have to make so ultimately, my job is as an employee and my job is then to carry out the wishes of, of the board that the fans voted in. So when we had that crowd trouble and without going back round it all, obviously my name was put to some of, some of those decisions. And that's fine because that's why, that's why I'm employed and some of those won't have been popular. However, I think what they will have shown is they've proved to be correct because ultimately with the statement we, we put out there about Manchester FA, and congratulating us our fan behaviour, that shows that while while those decisions may have not been universal popular, that actually they were the correct decision. So in terms of my own position, you know, we have a strategy on where we want to take this football club. I'm employed by the board as an employee of the football club to take this club full forward. You know, as and when I wish to resign, that will obviously be down to my own uh, where, where I feel I can take this football club, but if I feel I've took it far enough, that certainly isn't at the moment. Or, you know, if the if the if the board wished to remove me from my position, that was obviously a conversation between me and the board. But from what I understand at the moment, the belief is that I'm doing a, a pretty reasonable job. Uh, and ultimately, to answer your question directly, I, I obviously have uh, no intention to, to resign at the moment. Sort of second to that, a, a question very much on the the similar vein, um, which you've 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 covered um, in part. But I'll I'll ask it um, for the for the transparency. It reads. When will you be resigning because your people skills are awful and you clearly aren't cut out for the job? Again, so without knowing who's potentially asked that and, it, you know, if they've even met me, it's quite a difficult question to answer. You know, uh, I think I think it's a very demanding job that I do, considering the lack of manpower that we have. There will be times I'm, I'm under significant amount of pressure. Uh, however, you know, I think my people skills are OK, but I guess you'd say, well, you'd expect me to say that. Ultimately, I have to deal with a number of stakeholders, whether it's fans, whether it's council, you know, whether it's opposing clubs, uh, Manchester FA. There's lots of stakeholders I have to engage, and that is a key part of, of, of what I do in my day job. So I'd, I'd like to think that through some of the good work that we've done and some of the quick wins that we've had, as I've already stipulated, that my people skills must be OK uh, or, or even better than OK. But ultimately, what I'd say is I'm always open and around on, on a match day for people to talk to. You know, I have seen, you know, I spoke to a couple of fans recently who we had some direct challenges regarding me. They'd never actually met me. So, you know, th- th- this particular fan was saying, that, you know, I don't really think you're cut out for this job, for example. He'd never actually ever had a conversation with me. He just read some things online. So I guess, you know, you need the full picture to make an opinion of me. If, if you've had a conversation with a fan and, and you don't think I've got any people skills, Listen, as with anything, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. That's what makes football such a, a great place to work in. Uh, but ultimately, you know, am I the finished article? No, no. have I got improvement areas to, to make? Of course I have, like, like, like we all have in our workplaces. And I'll try and continue to work with fans to, to get the club where we want to get back to. And the more things we do like this with the Q&A or with the fans forum uh, that we had in the summer, the more those relationships will, will build over time. But I go back to what I said a bit earlier on. 
uh, you know, I should be under the spotlight that the most important thing is Dave, the team and winning on the pitch. You know, if my name was never heard again, that would suit me down to the ground. How does Neil feel about the online feeling that he's merely a puppet for Mr Young, obviously referring to, to Phil Young, the, uh, the chair of the CBS board? Well, it won't surprise you, Adam, to know that I don't spend a lot of my time online because uh, generally I don't, I don't get much time to. Uh, so, you know, ultimately my, my best work is done, uh, whether it's in my office devising strategy, whether it's engaging commercial partners, whether it's trying to increase fan engagement, whether it's working with the community, etc. Uh, so if I was to pay attention to online and sit there reading online or uh, read every tweet that I'm tagged in, then I wouldn't be delivering as an employee to the members, I wouldn't be doing my job because effectively, you know, I'd just be replying to tweets 24 seven and I won't get any work done. So, and I think to be fair to me as well, I think for my own mental health and, and mindset, which mental health is a, is a big consideration at the moment is that if I was just to sit reading all them as well, I wouldn't be in the best possible place to deliver the strategy of the football club over, over the next five years. So, you know, ultimately what I will say is, as, as I said before, the board is made up of people that the fans voted in. The, the board have put me in, in a position. And, you know, what I will say is that anyone who spends any time with me, no one pulls my strings. I'm my own person and I'll make my own decisions. There's a question later on uh, about sort of protecting um, volunteers and, and fans on social media to abuse, which we'll, um, we'll get to, which obviously you, you referred to briefly there. Um, Sort of carrying on from from that, um, one fan asks, uh, please could you confirm the names, roles and hours of all paid members of staff? Yeah, so I think some of this is comes out in the accounts anyway, but effectively, you know, I'm, I'm the CEO and club secretary. Uh, we have uh, Casey, who was announced six, seven weeks ago now as the community officer. We have Stuart Wright, who is the stadium manager. And we have, we have Ben, that you'll have seen around the place as assistant stadium manager and those are the permanent employees that are currently employed on full-time contracts. On an interview with some podcasters the, the episode of which was named Inside the Rebirth of Barry FC you say you've had good communication with all stakeholders including benefactors this fan asks uh, could you give any details of the meetings with them and potential solutions regarding them partnering as intended? Yeah so you'll know that on one of my other previous videos we discussed the makeup of Berry Football Club in terms of the stadium management company, the FSSB, etc., cetera. Um, and part of that will be different boards that are in operation. And I obviously won't sit on all those boards. Uh, so some of those decisions, if you're talking about the, the benefactors alone, some of those decisions will include conversations that will need to be had with the benefactors. Uh, so, you know, if I give you an example, we've obviously uh, leased the uh, motorbike training out on the car park. Uh, that is linked to the stadium management company. I don't sit on the stadium management company, but obviously the car park affects the running of the football club. So all these things, you know, sort of intertwine. So conversations will then need to be had about how those, you know, whether, whether it's the accounts come in, whether it's the payments, whether it's the space and allocation that we use. And so conversations will need to be had with the benefactors, for example, so at, at times, and I will go to the appropriate board. Uh, and, and then those people on my behalf sometimes will have those conversations. So some of it will be done uh, directly, uh, whether it's for email, whether it's for a telephone conversation, some of it will be through meetings that I'm not part of because that doesn't cover my my remit or role of responsibility. Another question around um, the benefactors. Uh, this fan asks: uh, We never hear anything from benefactors these days. Are they still with us? If not, why not? And secondly, into the same question that this fan asks. People still keep referring to us as AFC Berry. Is it Berry FC or AFC Berry or Berry AFC? Just, just clarify your position on that. Yeah, I, I won't be over the complete full history as, as you would be, but obviously, you know, Berry, you know, if you, if you want to go back to the, the old news, Berry AFC obviously played at Radcliffe. We know the story behind that. And then obviously it was voted for Berry FC to be, you know, renamed Berry FC and it was put to the vote and it was come back to, to Gig Lane. So we are now Berry FC. Uh, it's listed on companies, houses, Berry FC, and then in brackets, 2019. Uh, and we are effectively one, one football team uh, playing at Gig Lane. In terms of the, the football club, the football club uh, is, is, is an owned by the Supporters Society. So ultimately, my, my remit within my role 
doesn't doesn't demand that I'm in constant contact with, with the benefactors because when you when you're talking about the benefactors, you're going back to the effectively ownership of the stadium, and my role is to run the day to day football operations. So apart from the bits that I've spoken about before, where they intertwine because of space allocation, or licenses, or leases, etc., there, there isn't that need to have to have, to have that conversation. Uh, and ultimately, if you look at the constitution of the club and, and how it's made up, it's a hundred percent fan owned. I think there is. This, it's still coming through probably with some of this line of questioning that I've spoken about on previous videos that there's obviously still a, a slight perception out there that the, the football club is owned by part of it at least, or whether it's 5149, you know, refer to the German model, for example, that it's owned by benefactors, that the football club is a 100% operation run by run by myself in terms of state, in terms of operations. Community is obviously a, a big part of this football club, Neil, and it's, as you mentioned before, obviously, uh, Casey Lynch has, has come in as uh, community development manager over the um, last few weeks and obviously um, she's started her new role and has um, worked with, with various different stakeholders to, to get things progressing even further on the, the community side um, of the, the football club. There's a, a few questions here which I, I know you've, you've discussed with Casey in terms of um, to, to get these uh, answered um, for the, the fans. And the, the first one um, in this category reads, does the club have a strategy for raising the profile of the club and particularly uh, encouraging increased attendances? If not, why not? And if yes, can you uh, briefly outline this? Yeah, so first of all, you know, it's great to now have Casey on board. And uh, as we grow our football club, it becomes a near impossible job for me to be across everything completely. Uh, I'm a lot closer to the commercial activations and strategy that we've had because I've needed to, because it needed to bring revenue into the football club. Uh, but my my priorities now differ as we as we grow as a football club. So that that's why it's really important to now bring Casey in as a community uh, development officer. Uh, she's now coming. She's been in the building six or seven weeks. The initial priority was to make sure that we got the the pitch maximised in terms of renting the pitch out. But as she's now moving forward, she's able to develop more into the role that she would to, that she was hired for. So I will refer to a, a couple of points here on the sheet because I don't do this now on an everyday basis. And uh, obviously, I didn't really want to ask Casey to, to come onto camera and explain. I've made sure about a, a meeting with Casey just to see where we're up to. So I think it's important to say, first of all, part of that interview process that we went through with all the candidates was that they had to present a community development plan to us. So first of all, yes, yes, there is a plan and that was part of the uh, interview process to start off with. Uh, secondly is by having participation on the pitch by a wide range of groups uh, from uh, preschool footballing right through to veterans football uh, that will be using the club on a, you know, an every day and every evening basis. Uh, we'll be engaged in different communities, groups both on and on the pitch. Uh, in terms of added things within that community plan, well, obviously the success on the pitch, there's overall fan experience, uh, advice from experts in fan experience in the areas, uh, supporter feedback, uh, stadium improvements. Uh, we've spent significant amounts on the stadium, obviously over the summer, which has been well documented. Uh, community engagements, uh, equality, diversity, uh, inclusion initiatives, which we're going to be moving forward into, uh, and building a football family from the juniors right through to the first team, uh, getting families involved, spreading the word about the football club. And you'll already see in Casey, I think she's, she's done a post or she's mentioned about the amount of junior teams. And we have teams, Berry Ballers playing as young as five or six year olds playing here as well. So through having a communi communication and a community, community and activation strategy and delivering on that plan, will ultimately should, everything we do should come back to attendance. So you should see that attendance start going up. So. I think, as I said at the fans forum over the summer, my belief is over a period of time, I think I said two and a half years at the time, we can potentially get to a near a 5,000 crowd. That isn't going to happen overnight and it will need Casey to be enrolled for a good period of time to get these initiatives up and running. We'll also be doing, she's obviously got a strong network with schools, having previously been a, a previously a deputy a head teacher. She's obviously got some FA qualifying coaching badges as well. So she's going out to schools, doing some coaching. She'll be also be giving some free tickets to the schools to try and get the mums and dads involved. She's doing the mascots. She's got the flag bearers there as well. We've got Peel of the Dog, hopefully you've now seen up and running on, on match days as well and going around. And all these will be initiatives that feed into the wider community plan. And obviously there's 
before this um, video airs, there's um, a, a piece on the website that, that fans can, can go to and, and look at sort of how the um, the pitch booking process has, has been confirmed and external um, stakeholders can um, book their um, slot on the pitch if they, they haven't already um, got in involved um obviously you've you've mentioned um a, a number of different areas um sort of through preschool football veterans football etc something that um sort of pre-2019 berry football club did in the, the community trust department was had quite a um successful disability um team where sort of um people can, can get involved um, with that, and one ask, one fan asks quite simply, um, are we going to start a disability team? Yeah, so I've had a chat with Casey about this, and and you know I, I will read a couple of her bullet points that she's she's put down after that meeting. I'd read it. So first of all, yeah, absolutely, we are. Uh, in a very short space of time, we've increased the number of players representing Barry at different levels and uh, at different ages from our elite teams and recreational women, and now men's teams and junior teams. And in fact, at the moment, we've got over four hundred. Uh, registered players. The next stage of that plan is to look at children of, of different ages and also offer uh, football for disability groups, uh, which there is a lack of that offering in, in the Berry area. Uh, just this week we had some of our coaches attend Berry Jigsaw Disability Football Training to assist at their session. Um, we've also had meetings with the FA about disability and the lack of disability football provision in the town, so we're looking to try and address that. Uh, not only will we soon be offering uh, uh, pan disability football for youngsters, but we'll also be establishing a Down syndrome group and an adult pan disability group as well. Uh, this needs to be planned carefully, but we've also started uh, looking at forming an a enthusiastic group of coaches and administrators who are looking forward to launching this strategy. So what I'd say is watch this space. Uh, in addition, we want to start to develop a longer term strategy and how we can be even more inclusive as a club on match days. Um, some of those things I've probably touched on before from an EDI perspective. And that might be, you know, such as, for example, playing cricket on the pitch. Uh, not actually on the pitch. There was a different match you can put down so it won't damage the pitch. But it just, just means that the more we diversify, we open ourselves much more up to the community that we surround ourselves in, which is the whole idea of being a fan-owned community club. Final question in this um, community section. We've we sort of briefly sort of touched on it um, in the, the last two um answers but um this question from this fan reads uh, what is being done to increase the fan base and bring the current fan base together so increasing the fan base is obviously a, a really high priority for everyone at the club and that goes back to a, an answer that i raised before if you've only got two sources of revenue which are commercial and sponsorship and match day if you're only literally working on one of them then then you then you're ignoring the other one and you know back of a fag packet sort of calculation if you go from a 3,000 crowd to a 5,000 crowd over a season, that's worth up to, you know, up to another quarter of a million pound in the coffers. That can be used for communi communi community activation strategies. It can obviously be used for investment in a team. It can be used for investment in infrastructure behind the club. So it's a massive, uh, it's a high priority for the football club. Uh, we want to encourage younger fans to attend games, such as launching our own junior uh, and community football teams. And in the last few weeks alone, we launched our junior shaker membership scheme, which you'll have seen advertised on the website. We're also increasing our flag bearers and mascots from local grassroots teams and engaging them further with, a, further with our offer, offering on the pitch. And we'll be offering some free coaching and uh, school visits as well and providing some complimentary tickets. It's important to note that, you know, it would be very easy just to effectively say we've got a 12,000 seat stadium, just give everyone free tickets. But ultimately, uh, that won't have a sustainable strategy moving forward and won't increase that match day revenue. Uh, other things in the pipeline, you know, we've talked about fans forum, we've talked about establishing fan zones, which I don't know if that's a question coming down the line later, uh, but the, the, all those things will increase communication and uh, community participation. So moving into um, supporter areas of the the ground, Neil, obviously we, we touched on this in, in your video that we, we filmed in the stand just before the, the opening home game um, of the season. Um, one of the points we discussed um, at that point was the uh, the fan zone and uh, one fan asks, are we any nearer uh, to having a fan zone? Uh, 
complicated question um, because it involves a number of stakeholders. It's not just as easy as, as putting something there. So where we are is this. Currently, we have an alcohol license in the ground. That alcohol license covers everywhere to sell alcohol apart from the place we want to sell it, which is uh, at the entrance to the south stand. So that's where we ideally see our, our fan zone going in. That needs a variation to the alcohol license, which costs some money to, to apply for. Not, not, not a big amount of money and something that could easily be done. However, before, before we do that, there's other considerations within that area. So the first one is it backs onto a rest home or an, o, an OAP care home. So there's some work we need to do around potential noise, noise pollution, because you'd either probably want a band in there before a game, which is going to create noise, or you might want the early kickoff on Premier League TV, which is also going to create noise. Uh, there's also some hoops to jump through regarding building regulations. So if we have a cover over it, which we would need to bear in mind the weather we have in Manchester, uh, then you need to get through the building regulations and anything that's up for more than 28 days consecutively would need to get past building regs. Now, ultimately, you could get around that potentially by, well, Neil, it will just get taken down and put back up, but then you need a structure that can do that. Uh, early indications are to, to get a structure that would what we'd need is you're probably paying around £700 per game or to buy the actual structure itself, you're talking about probably about eight or 9000 so bear in mind the fan zone has to be free, which is the whole idea we're doing it. To start making that revenue back, we need some kind of guarantee that we think we'd get fans going in there. Now, ultimately, within those considerations and without going back into the, the Starkeys debate around you know, a pioneer programme, uh, ultimately, we, for a period of time, have been telling fans to arrive at the stadium to hop at half past one on a match day. And people will have their own routines in what they do before that, whether they stay at home and have lunch or whether they're frequenting their local establishments and, and going in there. So I've also got a way up that if we put a fan zone in there, is it going to get used? And what time is it going to get used from? Because ultimately, going back to what I said before about you need to either drive up commercial revenue or save on your costs. If we then put the fan zone in there and it's free of charge, we're going to have to make the money back that's going to cover the canopy it's going to cover any rental of a, of a TV for earlier Premier League games. It's going to cover any potential staffing in there. And we are at least going to break even. And uh, at the moment, I don't know if, 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 if we are. We need some more information on it. But there is also other concerns. For example, the fire authority have raised some issues around can a fire engine get through that space if there's a fire. So there's other regulatory and logistical challenges which, which, which we have to get through. And they're just not quick. They're just not quick fixes because obviously you're dealing with councils, you're dealing with authorities and you, you can't just make things happen as quick as you'd want to. So probably not what fans want to hear in terms of they probably want it there tomorrow. But ultimately, for me to control the costs as well, I have to make those considerations. Similar to that in terms of um, capacities at um, games, obviously a, a capacity limit of 200 supporters has been set um, for both the, the ladies' games and the under twenty threes, obviously we, we touched on earlier about the the stewarding and the sort of one to, to two hundred and fifty fans. Uh, mm. I guess that is the the reason for that two hundred uh, capacity cap. I mean, listen, it's it's not a hard cap, and we're obviously open to if we need to, if we need to open more, we will. The, the facts are, I don't think we've really gone out there and said, well, we're not we're going to start turning people away. We're, we're trying to gauge it. So the average. You know, attendance, I think, at a women's game, for example, it, you know, you're talk, talking 120, 130. So if it starts getting up to the 200 and we need to revisit it, of, of course we will. But obviously, if we're below 200, then you don't have stewarding costs. So that's a consideration. Um, and I think, secondly, you have to take into account the price you're charging for people to get in. So at a men's game, we're charging £10 to get in. At a women's game, the top of my head, I think it's £3. So ultimately, if you're only getting that amount of fans in and, you, and you're charging £3, to break even if you're paying stewarding costs becomes quite a difficult conversation. Uh, that also manif manifests itself into what 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 uh, establishments do you have open on a women's match day? So if you're going to open your kiosk with your external catering company, he's going to want to take at least a minimum amount of money to make it worthwhile coming down on a Sunday to open. So at the moment, we've took the decision not to open the kiosk, but we'll open Starkeys. And obviously, by us opening Starkeys, we make a higher margin on our beer than we do on the deal that with the cater because ultimately we're staffing it 
So I'd say it's a, it's a moving feast. You know, uh, it's not nothing hard and fast in there. As women's football gets more popular at Gig Lane, then certainly we're not going to be wanting to turn fans away. But at, at the moment, that's where we're at. The decision to not allow pay on the gate in the south stand was quickly reversed um, following fan feedback. Uh, this fan asks, what learning has been taken from that and will be implemented in terms of fan member and volunteer feedback prior to decisions being made and announced? Okay. So, ultimately, we are, uh, we are, we are a fan-owned club, as I've said before, and that the fans voted a, a board into place. And that, that board all have full-time day jobs and they've now em employed me to effectively run the day-to-day -day operations of the football club. Okay, not all not all the decisions will be popular, but from a cost point of view, we'll need to look at. So ultimately, when the decision was made to, uh, I think at the time it was, we'll let we'll let everyone go into the south stand. They can buy online. They can even buy online stood in the car park. But if you want to pay cash on the gate, we want you to come into the main stand. Now, without going back to all the old answers I said before, that that's because of the student costs involved. So we've spent a significant amount of money. If you go back to last season. There was only 600 people allowed in the main stand out of a capacity of 2,300. We've now spent a lot of money in getting the main stand open. But if we don't put any fans in it, we're going to steward in the main stand and everyone's going to sit in the south stand. So th these are all, all considerations that have to take into account. And, and when fans sometimes ask, well, where, where the board consulted or why wasn't it put out to vote? I mean, we ha I think we just have to be realistic here on some fans, what's important to some fans won't be important to other fans. And ultimately, if we just kept putting everything out to a vote all the time, then there'd be no, there'd be effectively no need to have someone running a football club because we just do everything by proxy. So ultimately, you know, we can't put 3,000 fans in a stand and with, with, with a microphone and say, well, what do you think about this? Because ultimately, as I said before, the great thing about football is everyone has a different view. So in terms of the learns, well, you know, what, what I'd say is we, we, we doubled back on that decision because we thought it was, there was a lot of, you know, noise around it and, and, and should we reflect and, and make a different decision. But what I would say is, even though that decision was changed, it still presented the same problem, which is we've now got a main stand where not enough people are sitting in it and we've got a steward for the main stand. So the problem hasn't gone away. The fans, you know, the fans may have thought, OK, we, we've got back to where we wanted to sit, but the problem still exists because ultimately we've got two stands that hold five and a half thousand people and we only get an average of 2,800 fans. So the problem won't go away until we you know, get more fans in, in through the door. You mentioned attendances there. This um, fan asks, I know it's early doors in the season, but crowds seem to be down on last season. Have we got fewer season ticket holders than last season or have we lost some more to Ratcliffe? Well, I don't think we've got... I don't think we've got enough data to tell us where we've potentially lost any fans to. You know, that obviously that's, that's an opinion at the time. There's a lot of you know, emotive comments around what our attendances are. In fact, you know, if I looked at the two most popular things that are probably, you know, out there or people come and speak to me about or just in the general public domain, it's generally uh, advertising boards and, and, and attendance. So I guess where we're on attendance is this, and, and I wasn't here, so I can only go off the facts and the data that was there. If you go back to the start of last season, bear in mind you've got the euphoria of coming back to Gig Lane, okay? The first game, we had 5,400 people. The second game, we had 4,200 and the third game we had 3,300. So from a lost fans perspective, from raw data, you might sit here and say, well, where did those 2,000 fans go? Now, I can't comment on that because I wasn't here and I don't know if anyone looked at that or, or what went on with that. But ultimately, I would say that that 2,000 fans was effectively a quick hit of emotion, people coming back and seeing what it was all about. Okay. What then started to happen is that started to plateau. So once you start looking at attendances from October onwards last season, you pretty much got to a Saturday attendance of roughly 3-3-1, and you got to a Tuesday night attendance of roughly 2 6 two, seven. That's where it, it plateaued out. Now, again, not to be knee-jerk and just to look at our attendances so far this season, up until the game we've just had, we'd had a Saturday home league game against Earlham on the 10th of August. We'd had a Bank Holiday Monday game, We'd had a Saturday FA Vars game and we'd had a Tuesday night. So you'll have heard me talk on this video about data. We'd only had four games at home and every single one of them had been a different day or a different event going on. OK, so when you're trying to look at what attendances are, it's very difficult to look at. Some fans talk about 
when we were back in the Football League, for example, and what our attendances were there. When we were in the Football League, our average attendance was about 3,100. And out of that, 300 of those were away fans. <coughs> now, at the moment, our average away fan attendance is 50. So again, looking at that data, it's not as easy as just saying, well, last week was this and last season was this, because was it the same game? Was it the same time in a month? Was it a different time of year? There's lots of things to look into account. So where this sort of level's at, because I don't want to uh, avoid the question, is I think our, ultimately it all comes under match day and ticketing. So whether it's season tickets revenue coming in or whether it's people pay on the gate, you want that money to come out at about the same. What, no matter how it's made up, whether it's you know 90% season ticket, 10% pay on the gate or 50-50, you want that pot to be the same amount of money. So where we're at at the moment is season ticket revenue is slightly down. And... For me, that's what I would expect it to be because it was our first season back, back at Gig Lane. You had the euphoria and we didn't get promoted. As with any club out there, you're going to lose some fans as a result of that. If you look at the data that exists at the moment out there, we are one of the best supported non-league football clubs. And ultimately, like it or not, that is what we are. We are a non-league football club. And I think last time I looked last week, I think we're the second best supported club in the non-league pyramid in terms of attendances. So actually, we're in a good place. Do we do we want to increase the crowd? Absolutely. And I've spoken about that before, about where we want to get to in initiatives we can put in place. But I don't think it's as simple as just saying, you know, it, again, if you, if you read what's out there, and I obviously do take a snapshot of what's out there, but, you know, one fan will say we, we had 5,000 average attendance last season. Clearly, we didn't. Another fan will say, well, no, we only ever had 3,100. So that's why it's important, and hopefully I've demonstrated to you today on the video that, I've looked at that data across a number of touch points and the honest answer is currently, yes, the season ticket holders membership is slightly down and in terms of a match day attendance at the moment, bear in mind we've not had that continuity of fixtures. Uh, we've had a Saturday league game on the 10th of August. Our next Saturday league game is in November. So 10, 10 weeks with, uh, without a Saturday league game. So, so you can't exactly measure it at the moment, but if you, if you were to push me on it and say, Neil, where do you think we're at early indications? I'd say on a normal Saturday at the moment, very early indication, it looks like we're probably about 300 down. And, and on a Tuesday night, we look to be about 200 down. But that question for me is another question. Give it to the next Q&A you do with me to say, right, Neil, you've probably had four or five Saturdays now. Now what's it looking like? Moving on um, to a it's quite a, a detailed question, which... Um, concerns the uh, ladies' toilets in the uh, south stand. I'll, I'll read it um, as is is written by this um, this supporter, which reads: With over four hundred thousand um, cash, uh, four hundred thousand pounds cash in the bank, uh, please can we spend some money on significantly renovating slash modernising and maintaining the ladies' toilets in the south stand? I'm reliably informed they are the worst ladies' facilities in the league. And to put the point of being disgustingly unhygienic, which is embarrassing given the facility as a whole, it's unfair to those who must use them whilst us men have life so much easier and short-sighted if we're encouraging a broader fan base. If you want to argue this is not the case, can I request you go and sit in each cubicle at the end of match days? Okay, so I'm assuming that question was written by a man to, uh... And then obviously he's saying he's been reliably informed. So it's obviously difficult to answer because it's, there's about two, different, two or three different points of view going on there. What I'll say is clearly I've, I've you know, never been in the ladies' toilets on a match day for obvious reasons. Uh, but what I'll say is now the stadium's getting a lot more or usage, whether that be you know, certainly Starkeys or, uh, or, or more crowd in the south stand, then it's important that we make sure that our facilities are fit for purpose. Now, at the moment, we have a set of daytime volunteers that everyone will know and see around the place, five or six people who come and come and do their, their work every day. But clearly, if we need to move to a model where we're looking at getting some you know, cleaners in, professional cleaners, and taking a closer look at the end of a match day, then obviously, you know, I don't want women coming to the football match and feeling they can't use our facilities. That's absolutely out of order, if that's the case. So if people are getting that, that experience, then I apologise, and I'll make sure I uh, get to it and see what the problem is. Thank you.